Our scripture reading for this Transfiguration Sunday is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him, and he led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And the, there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. And then a cloud appeared. And in it enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. And suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord for God's people. I want you to imagine a, a preacher standing up on a Sunday morning and saying, from now on, we should tell no one about Jesus. It all ends now. Don't tell your children. Don't tell your friends. Don't tell your neighbors about Jesus. Not even if they seem desperate or in a great time of spiritual crisis, not if they're curious and honestly seeking the truth, not even if they ask you directly about the hope that you have. From now on, we will tell no one about Jesus. So how do you think you would react? <laughs> well... Some of us might actually breathe a sigh of relief. There's nothing in the world that terrifies us more than the notion of telling other people about Jesus. We tremble at the thought of saying something wrong or, or saying it in the wrong way. We worry about offending someone. But even then, after all that, after the sigh of relief, we would probably have the same reaction, which is, what? Don't tell anybody about Jesus. I mean, that can't be right. I mean, this is one of the big important things we're supposed to do. From the time we're old enough to pay attention in Sunday school, we learn the importance of telling others about Jesus. We learn that we are supposed to be a faithful witness in the world. And that's why it's odd when we come to the Gospel of Mark and we notice this pattern. And it's really surprising at first when you see it. You think about all the examples. When you read through the Gospel of Mark, you read about Jesus' ministry. He's casting out demons. The demons begin to call Jesus by name. He, he sends them out, and Jesus says, don't tell anyone about this. There's a story of Jesus healing a man with leprosy. Jesus tells him, go and present yourself to the priest so you can be accepted back into society. But Jesus tells him, don't say a word to anyone else. There's stories of healing the deaf, healing the mute, and he tells them, don't mention this now. He heals a blind man, and Jesus tells him not to go back to his village. There's the time Simon Peter made his great confession. You are the Christ, and Jesus says, I am, but don't tell anybody. Even at the empty tomb, when Jesus has been raised from the dead, Mark tells us that the women were afraid and they said nothing to anyone. And then you've got our text today. This mountain of transfiguration, the grand spectacle of the whole thing. It's like nothing that's ever been witnessed before. There's Moses and Elijah with Jesus, his face and his clothes glowing, and this thunderous voice from a cloud surrounds them. They experience that, and Jesus says, 
to his disciples on the way down the mountain. Don't tell anybody about this. So what in the world's going on here? Well, New Testament scholars refer to it as the messianic secret or the secret of the Messiah that unfolds in Mark's gospel. And there's a lot of debate around why Jesus is always telling people to keep quiet about him. You know, maybe, maybe he was painfully shy and he wanted to avoid attention. Perhaps he wants to control his own press. One theory is that Jesus didn't want the news to be about him. He wanted it to be about the kingdom of God. Another theory is that Mark, as a gospel writer, is showing a, a really brilliant touch of irony. It's his way in his gospel of saying, no one can slow down the truth of the good news. Even if Jesus himself tries to downplay it, people will still respond because they're so hungry for it. Many folks say that the reason Jesus didn't want the news spread was more of a timing issue. The moment just wasn't right. And even in the text that we hear today about the transfiguration, Jesus asks his disciples not to mention anything until after the resurrection. He's afraid that the mission might be compromised if they speak too soon. So there's, there's a number of theories about why Jesus says this in Mark's gospel. But I think there may be another reason. And it has to do with truly sacred experience. I know you've felt that because we all have. I know you've had a moment when something was beyond explanation. There was some incredible moment of grace or kindness when you desperately needed God to show up, and God did. Or maybe it was a gesture of unconditional love, or, or it was a moment of gut-wrenching brokenness, or unsolicited hope in the face of darkness. And if you experienced that, I know that you wanted to say something. You, you wanted to tell somebody about it. But chances are there were no words not in all the languages of the world were there enough words. And you knew right then and there that to say something would be to limit the experience, to reduce it down to some idolatrous little token. Maybe later you could find the words, but not now. I remember several years ago during one of our community-wide Holocaust remembrance services. I remember listening to our speaker who was a survivor of the concentration camps. And he talked about being loaded up on those trucks as a child. And he had this, this small viola with him. And he used to play songs for his family. He used to play songs for his neighbors. His, his captors eventually seized the instrument. But before they did, they demanded, play us one of your songs. And he told us in the congregation that night, his thought was, you want me to entertain you with what's sacred in my life. You know, one of the privileges I have of being in this position as a pastor is I get the opportunity to see people and, and in moments, and I get to hear about moments that are truly sacred. I get to witness from time to time an incredible act of generosity. And if you heard about it, it would blow your mind. Or I, I get to be a witness to an amazing act of kindness or forgiveness. I get to see experiences that make me a believer again and again. And I see those things and I want so badly to share them. I want so badly to say something to someone. But I've learned along the way that to turn those moments into sermon illustrations, whenever you do that, there's a line you cross. 
And you cross that line and what is so holy to us becomes so empty. To paraphrase Soren Kierkegaard, some things are true when whispered, but they become false when shouted. Jesus makes that imperative about saying nothing because he knows the power of sacred experience. He's not saying, look, say nothing because we don't want people to know. He's not saying, say nothing because we're trying to hoard our religious devotion. It's not say nothing so that we can live our lives in this walled-off fortress having a secret knowledge. No, I think the point of say nothing is for us not to ruin it with the words of whatever we're trying to pitch to the society around us. Don't feel like we have to explain away what's most meaningful. Jesus knew what happens when sacred experience becomes tabloid conversation. When it's picked apart down at the corner coffee shop. When it's dissected at the beauty parlor. Jesus knew that the experience loses some of its power when it's filled with religious slogans and phrases. Tom Long says that our culture has a lot of God chatter and religious white noise. He says there seems to be a famine of authentic speech about God. And maybe that's what our world needs most from us. Something authentic. Not just words, but actions and connections. And I know that that word itself, authentic, it's become a cliche but it doesn't mean that it's less important. You see, it's vital when our faith enables us to live in true and as, as true and authentic witnesses of the grace we know in Christ. And part of that entails this authenticity. It entails recognizing the sacred experience is not something that we parade around like a trophy. It's not something we flaunt like a fancy pair of shoes. It's not something that we dress up for a slick marketing campaign. And it's certainly not something we use as a battering ram to win an argument. So what does it look like to be a faithful witness of Christ? Well, it looks like seeing and knowing the depths of someone else's journey, the pain they face, the energizing elements they experience, what they love, what they're afraid of. It means care. It means caring more about this fellow child of God than we do about our own desire to come off as so certain. And it means taking their questions seriously and honoring them. Honoring the path they've been on and all the unique elements that entails. It means respecting the light they bear witness to and realizing that that they may have something to offer to us too. It means treating the incredible and profound grace of Christ in such a way that it is a blessing and it's not a curse to others. And I think it means we keep showing up. Jesus and his disciples shared this powerful and mind-blowing experience on the mountaintop. They, They were there with the biggest heroes of the faith they ever knew, Moses and Elijah. And God himself spoke out loud, clear as the thunder in a storm. And yet they left that moment and they walked down the mountain to a crowd of people who were hungry for something real. Notice that they they didn't stay up there like it was a vacation away from the real world. And they didn't breeze past the crowd riding the high of their spiritual experience. No, 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 they rolled up their sleeves to join the fray of what it means to be fully human with a God-sized faith living in a real world. Because the point of sacred experience, it's the experience itself. And life is full of sacred experience. There are people walking around who believe vastly different things than we do. We know that. And yet they are created in the same divine image that we are. 
And God delights in them in ways that defy our understanding. So when Jesus says to his disciples, say nothing, it's not about hiding the truth. It's about making sure that we have prioritized the same commitment that Jesus has which was to pour himself into this life most fully so that he could truly and faithfully and yes, authentically bear witness to the unconditional love of his Father, which is for all people. People he, need, he needs to know. And so for us, I think the word is keep listening. Keep listening to others. Keep being a friend. Keep engaging. Keep sharing experiences. Keep tasting and seeing and loving. Keep doing what's right. Keep being the good. We will experience, inevitably, we will experience these mountaintop moments. And they give us life and energy and purpose. And we must be willing to, uh, willing to make sure that we don't reduce them to tricks and trifles because they matter far too much for us to let them become something less. And I promise you, the authentic word that we have to speak, it will come. I'm not always sure how we find those words. I'm not sure how they find us but there will be words, authentic words, true words. And they'll be born out of a true experience, one that we didn't try to pawn off on society because that's the word that our world needs to hear. Something true that resonates and they need to hear it in what we say but also how we live. Amen. Let us offer a prayer this morning. Know that as we can't meet in person today, we are certainly praying for our community over the next couple of days. And let me remind you again of what the message we sent out yesterday, that if you, if you have a need you get in a bind, make sure you contact one of our ministers or one of our deacons, and we'll certainly see if we can put a team together to help you out. Let us pray. Holy and compassionate God, we thank you for the truth of who you are. We pray that you would let our experience of you and the hope we have in you and the grace we experience in you would you let it multiply? And would you let it bear fruit? Use us in this world to be beacons of your redeeming love. Let us tell your great story in what we say and how we live. We pray over these next few days that you would, uh, you would keep us safe that you would help our community do what it does best in times of need. Help us pull together. Help us to look out for our neighbors and help us to live out of the best of who we are. And we pray that you would continue to lead us as a church family, shape us as faithful disciples of Christ and help us to always be mindful of how we might offer the hope of your kingdom to those around us. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, may you go in peace. Amen.